How are people doing in the traveling salesman problem? How, what sort of uh, results are you getting for the, the 48 city tour? Anybody have any results for the 48 city tour yet? <laughs> Not very good. So, I was going to actually ask you if you'd be able to give us some sort of guideline benchmarks about what we should be. What were you considering under 148? Yes. Okay. I mean, if it's over 100,000, something's very bad. I don't think it's on, that bad. But 100,000 is quite large. Okay. I, I, I suspect you probably, I don't know how many random guesses it would see to feed 100,000. What about for the other ones? Uh, under 100,000 for all. <laughs> For at least the first three. I, I can't remember the fourth one right now since I just uh, introduced that one last year. Okay. Okay, so, so once more, um, I have to request to, 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 to keep conversations to yourself uh, at, a, at a softer level. If I can hear it, it's definitely too loud. Okay, Prisoner's Dilemma. Co-evolution. Okay, co-evolution is interacting, revealing uh, problems, for instance, that there's not a pure fitness function and things interact. Uh, a typical model there might be game playing. Uh, typical example of nature, easy one to imagine, is some sort of predator-prey relationship, whereas first uh, the, the predator involves some trait which makes it harder for the prey to escape. For the prey to escape, it has to uh, to fight back against that trade and so forth. So there's some form of evolutionary arms race. So uh, lots of people observing this in nature thought, well, how can we uh, have a, um, utilize this in nature? Okay, so I mean, utilize this with the genetic algorithm. First example will be from game playing. Um, we discussed how prisoner's dilemma works. And um, this is a very uh, influential uh, paper uh, where the idea is that uh, if, if in society or in individual situations we've, we face, there's many sorts of prisoner's dilemma, how come it's not the case that we don't always choose the Nash equilibrium? How is it possible for, um, for cooperative strategies to um, evolve? Um, usually the winning cooperative strategy is of a certain form in the class, but I think you said last week your, your, your strategy was to just cooperate all the time. Okay. Usually something else wins in class, which we'll get to in a moment. So we did some more examples of games and we discussed the notion of Nash equilibrium, which is uh, uh, an equilibrium position where if either other player had a choice in changing their action in the game, there's no way they could change their, their choice and, and uh, receive more utility if the other player didn't change. Okay. So, Maxwell-Rudd had this following experiment. Uh, I don't have all the details of the experiment here. Um, I don't think it's really necessary to understand the basic flavor of what Maxwell is trying to do. So right now, there's no uh, uh, genetic algorithm involved at all. Um, so what Axelrod did was, he said, let's have a uh, have a, a prisoner's dilemma contest. Just like we had a prisoner's dilemma contest in class, Axelrod organized uh, an academic prisoner's dilemma. So Axelrod invited a number of uh, players in from a number of academic disciplines to play. Um, he held two different uh, tournaments, two different times. Um, uh, the first tournament, there were 14 programs that got submitted. In the second program, there were 63 programs that were submitted. Uh, a surprising result from both of these tournaments was a, a particular strategy for playing a, a, a repeated prisoner's dilemma game called Tit for Tat 1. Tit for Tat is a uh, uh, quite, well, he, here it is, and it's straightforward. So the first turn, tit for tat always cooperates. And then uh, the second uh, turn, the, the second uh, round is it, it simply plays back 
what the previous opponent uh, played on the previous move. So for instance, if, uh, if, if the person plays, a, if this strategy plays against somebody who's completely aggressive, essentially the first round uh, tit for tat does less than optimal, but all the remaining rounds, if the other strategy is defecting all the time, um, you know, it does the best it possibly can in that scenario, um, which is one point. However, if, if, if tit for tat plays with either itself or some other uh, strategy that, that, for instance, cooperates all the time, for example, um, then uh, tit for tat will, will get as its uh, outcome um, uh, the value of, of both of the players cooperating. And if, if you remember the distribution of results last time, in fact, as I recall, over 15 games, only one person got the value 45 from cooperating all the time. So getting the value that cooperates every time is pretty good. But it requires tit for tat to play against somebody like itself, and it's no worse otherwise. So then, besides just having um, human players play um, this game, uh, Axelrod then considered the following setup. Let's uh, uh, program a, a GA to try to evolve strategies. Okay. So the way uh, Axelrod's uh, encoding worked was as follows. Uh, uh, so basically what would happen on a, on a single turn would be basically going from the tit for tat thing, uh, des describing a very simple finite automata. So if on the previous turn uh, uh, both players cooperated, then we can specify an action by putting down what it should do. So in tit for tat, what uh, it, it does is cooperate if both players cooperate. If tit for tat cooperated and the other player defected, then the strategy that is specified is D. Um, if the other strategy defected first, I mean if tit for tat defected and the other strategy cooperated, then tit for tat will cooperate. Okay, so as you see, it's it's mirroring the, this is the tit for tat player, this is the other player. Uh, tit for tat is mirroring the second player's plays, and somehow, so this, it, this strategy can be encoded with just the C, D, C, D, but we also have to express what happened on the first turn. Let's continue with the encoding of strategies that's going to be used in this GA. So, had considered um, all possible strategies with a, a slightly uh, larger uh, memory than a single move. Okay, and, and in this slightly larger space, um, So memory of three moves, well actually a much larger search space. So idea now is, is for all 64 cases, i.e. all of the, the three possible, all possible histories for the three last moves, we need to specify what the program will do. So for instance, if, uh, if, if the programming involved cooperated in, in, in the third to last turn and then the other player cooperated and so forth, we need to specify what will be done and so forth. So there's 64 possible cases. So that means you can encode uh, all these possible strategies over the last, that have a memory of three moves in a 64 bit string. And then uh, we also require uh, six additional bits. Why do we need the six additional bits?
because we need to we, we need history for the first move and for the second move and the third move. How will we know what to do on the very first play of our strategy? Well, we encode six bits, which is a a, a pseudo history of the first three plays. So, for instance, maybe we, we pretend that the players cooperated, 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 and then that way, when it goes to make its decision. It can look up its first move based on that history. When it goes to make its second move, it looks at the last four bits and makes a decision. Okay. So with this setup, how many? You know, some of these strategies aren't allowed, but how many different strategies are, are potentially represented in this representation? What's the, the strategy space, roughly speaking? So we're evolving a, a bit string, which is describing um, the strategy of our player with the history of three moves. And then we also encode six bits for pseudo history. So I just want to make sure that, that this is sufficient clear. It's, so we, we have six characters for the pseudo history, 64 characters which we need to, to specify our actions on, i.e. if this is our history, what do we do? So we have two to the 70 potential strategies. Okay. So the representation is, 70, is a 70 bit string and there's two to the 70 potential strategies. Some of these strategies uh, do the same thing as other strategies because they correspond to impossible histories on some of the details, but that's a detail. For instance, if you have a strategy that cooperates, cooperates, cooperates all the time no matter what, well then what you specify here doesn't matter. So when we say there's two to the 70 strategies, we're overcounting a little bit. Okay. Wait, I'm sorry. Why would the initial, why would initial six be added, be um, counted in the number of strategies? Because that de that determines your initial first, second, and third play. Somehow, you know, if I just say my my strategy is encoded by these. Uh, only these 64 bits, and I don't use the other part, I won't know how to make my first move because there's no history already. Okay. Okay? So, the, so for any given strategy, uh, those six bits differentiate how it will play those first three rounds. Oh, okay, I think I just interpreted what the strategy is wrong. Strategy is the algorithm for the outcome. More yes. like it's the out, what possible outcomes there could be. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So we're encoding two so we're encoding these uh, <coughs> players of this nature. Well, a spelling mistake on this line. Um, So running the GA, with what Axelrod then did was uh, uh, take those those players from the, the first tournament and then uh, play against those initial strategies. And um, so there's no coevolution in uh, uh, involved yet. Um, the GA against that, that fixed uh, set of strategies uh, once more evolved lots of strategies that had some sort of reciprocal nature, but at least against that fixed set of things tended to do slightly better against tit for tat, but they're often much like tit for tat. So then, rather than, than play the strategies against one another, uh, those fixed 
play evolve a single thing against these these 14 or 13 strategies which people had submitted, Axelrod then did the following experiment. Let's actually not have fixed strategies, but simply start out with random strategies and um, now play and see what happens. Okay. And so the title of his book is Evolution of Cooperation. Um, and so, uh, so now we don't have uh, a fixed fitness landscape. The, the fitness landscape uh, tended to uh, change over time. So without going into the exact experimental setup, and the exact experimental setup can certainly alter the way this, this details of these outcomes. In the experiment that, that Axelrod did, um, uh, the first few generations, if you kind of looked at the, uh, the, the sort of strategies that were in the pool of strategies, uh, strategies that defected a lot, dominated, uh, quickly came to dominate the population. But then after 10 to 20 uh, uh, strategies, um, it seemed like reciprocator strategies well, in, in his experiment, for circuitous strategies such as tit for tat and slight variants thereof, where you basically mirror the opponent's move, um, came to dominate the, the population. So, what would you? So, given that these are the results, and if we're just conjecturing, why would you conjecture that this might be a, a sensible path for uh, um, the? the fitness lines for the strategies in the population to evolve over time as why did we first see this and then see that? Why not vice versa? Why did cooperators dominate the population initially? How how would you explain this outcome? Yes. Why would that be? Um, because uh, in the in the uh, table you uh, you gave us with the, with the things, yes. usually when you defect and you have one um, collaborates, you get a larger reward. Yes. However, after time you start to realize, well, if you always do that, the other person will always do that. So you, so you can see in the beginning that if you have a pool of just random strategies. You know, somebody who's going to defect all the time is going to basically do better, who tends to cooperate more of the time because they're taking advantage of that. There's no kind of intelligence in the strategies. The, you know, the strategies in the pool are, in the beginning, are oblivious to what's, you know, they've just been generated at random. So, you know, things that cooperate more tend to be weaker than things that, that uh, defect more because the ones that defect more get more points. But somehow over time, this tends to uh, evolve in given the, the experimental parameters that Axelrod uh, had. Why might this evolve? So I, uh, ax the, the, the explanation that, that Axelrod would give would be the following is, is, is once you have, you, you start to have a tit for tat or a couple of tit for tat strategies in the population, think about what happens then. Imagine that your fitness is somehow determined by a series of matches that you play with other strategies in the population. Um, the strategies that are basically defecting a lot or defecting all the time are doing pretty well against one another. They, I mean, they, they don't get many points, but uh, that's fine. Imagine you have a, a strategy that reciprocates. In terms of if it plays against somebody who, who, who defects all the time, uh, it will do slightly worse, OK? Slightly worse. But suppose two of these reciprocator strategies play against one another and they both start cooperating. 
they do much better against one another. So there's, you know, these are kind of always doing the same except against pure cooperators. If there's pure cooperators or largely ignorant cooperators, uh, uh, then they're going to do great. But once those things die out, uh, and you have a slightly more sophisticated strategy, these will help one another out, and, and they'll win. And so, and so they can come to dominate the, strat the population. Okay. So uh, this was a, an inf so this kind of experiment or toy experiment it was perhaps uh, showed how 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 in a repeated prisoner's dilemma situation uh, society could get itself out of the black hole of always uh, defecting all the time. And this is uh, very influential. There's many very technical results on what's required for that sort of outcome to be and what a reciprocator is, but it's, it's a, a very influential, much studied um, result. Okay, let's look at a, another uh, example of coevolution. Um, this uh, paper um, has two nice ideas in it. Uh, we'll, we'll get to some uh, predator prey coevolution. So here we're going to have a nice classical discrete optimization algorithm, a very pretty one. Um, so a sorting network is a parallel cir circuit for sorting lists of fixed size. You imagine you're building a chip and you need the inputs on, on 16 lines sorted or 32 lines or 64 lines. You, you'd want some way of doing this efficiently. And even you know, before we had computers, people were, had things like sorting networks and mechanical machines. So uh, sorting networks were studied before there were uh, general purpose computers. Um, you, know, you can imagine that. Uh, so the idea of a sorting network is it needs to be correct and efficient. Um, from the point of speed, the, we'll see what a sorting network it, is. In a moment, the general thing that's going to determine the speed is the number of parallel steps. Um, in general, this is an example of a, a minimal logic design problem, i.e. we have some circuit elements and we want it to do some function of some kind. How do we use these circuit elements to do some function? There's many such problems of this type, and they're all generally uh, um, not so easy to solve. Okay. Okay, so let's understand how sorting networks work. I apologize for the blurriness of the slide, but let me move some chairs so I can lay on the slide. Okay, this is an example of a, a structured sorting network called um, battery sort. Okay. Let me explain the idea. Okay. Here we have a series of. Okay, this is a. Imagine this is a circuit, and the idea is that information is coming in from the right and and going to the left, and. Each line here corresponds to uh, a value. So, so imagine that here we have 16 lines. Uh, I'll just call them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, down to 16. Okay? And imagine on these 16 lines, you know, uh, there's a number on it. Okay? Now, what happens is is the numbers pass through here, and the idea is, is so maybe you know we have a, a, a 12 here, or a 3 there, or a 4 there, or a 10 here, and so forth, 95. And the idea is by the time this sorting network is done, uh, it's, it's sorted the numbers either in ascending or descending order. Okay? Um, now each of these arrow like symbols uh, represent a, a compare and switch operator. 
what do I mean? Um, so on this first line here, imagine you have an arrow here. And the idea of this is to sort in descending order. Okay? So what happens? 12 and 3 come in on this arrow. We're trying to sort in descending order. So 3 should be above 12. So what happens is on those lines there, 3 gets swapped with 12 because uh, 3 is, in, is, is smaller than 12. And likewise here, 4 and 10 come in on those lines. And uh, 4 and 10, nothing happens to them because they're already in ascending order. And then here's another arrow between these lines. Okay. So if you look at this diagram, and we counted the number of arrows, there's 63 comparisons. Uh, I'm not sure how many of these are, you know, this step, so this corresponds to one step. These two lines can kind of be combined in one, I, you can do these in parallel, and the results don't interfere with one another. Uh, so. The total number of comparisons is 63, and I forget what the number of, of you know, how much time it is, the, the number of effective parallel steps there are. Okay. So, right, operations in each column may be uh, performed in parallel, but, you know, even more so, for instance, these two things are happening in parallel, even though they're represented as two separate columns because one operation doesn't depend on the results of the other. Okay. So, um, are there a fixed number of um, kind of positions in which, like number of comparisons that could be along each line? Um, so, so there's like a grid. So the way I, I visualize it actually um, is as follows, um, which is kind of relevant to later on. To, uh, the sorting network is equivalent to a sequence of pairs of, of, of things. So the first set of pairs goes down something like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, 7, 8, dot, 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 15, 16, and then the next set is starting out something like 1, 3 here, um, 2, 4, I think. I, I don't know. I, I'm guessing. Dot, 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 dot. Now, once you give me these pairs in a sequence like that, I can figure out the grid because, um, you know, okay, I go, oh, yes, I can do all these in parallel. There's no conflict. And I keep going across and I go, I keep saying, oh, I can do these in in parallel, you know, once I get here, I know that I had to start a new column because I had one element used over. And then eventually I go here, I keep getting new elements, new elements, new elements. As soon as I get another element used over, I know I have to create another column. So you could, in terms of a representation, if you want to use a GA on it, you can represent it as a list. Okay? Um, and the kind of and you can imagine evolving two things. You can imagine trying to minimize the number of comparisons total, or you can imagine minimizing the number of parallel steps. Okay. Questions? No more questions. Okay. Um, now, I want you to take a, a few minutes of your own so you understand what goes on, is to try to uh, uh, design uh, a four element sorting network of minimal size. So a four element sorting network has to, uh, to be a, a valid sorting network has to sort any possible uh, set of four elements. And if you solve this quickly, uh, I encourage you to uh, to also prove a lower bound on the number of comparisons required by a starting network. Uh, just so you know where we're going, is Hillis is going to try to evolve some sorting networks, and in general, we don't know the minimal sizes of sorting networks.
So now take a few minutes, try to come up with your own four element sorting network. Uh, when you think you have it, raise your hand and show it to me and I can check if it's right, uh, or I'll try to check if it's right. I, sometimes it's hard to eyeball it if it's correct and you're trying to make it minimal and if you get that, think about what, what a nice lower bound is on a general n element sorting network. Solved it, or you have a question, raise your hand and I'll come by. I can solve these puzzles in my mind in case it fails. But <laughs> I'm to, uh, let me try to quickly find the case that it fails. I know. Okay. Does this one work? Works, but you can find something smaller. Yeah. <laughs> Try all 16. Yeah, those, there's 16 possible cases. I encourage you to try them to find them this one. I thought the proof was if it works, it works for a reverse list. It's it's a nice intuition, but which one is it? It's 
Is there a limit that you can you can only compare adjacent rows? No, 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 no. Definitely, if you take a look at the the sample, I uh, def if you yeah, you only write very slow. You need many comparisons if you only use the adjacent rows. Okay. I should have been clear about that. No, they can definitely be non-adjacent.
Solved it already. Raise your hand. Just have a rough idea on the numbers. Okay, you don't have to raise your hand. For those of you who've got it, think about a lower bound a little bit. How big can you make that lower bound? Classic sort of computer science question. It's kind of like a machine learning question too. Because <laughs> about what? So, uh, so figuring these story networks out isn't so easy, and trying to find a minimal one um, 
is a hard problem. Um, um, I think some of you picked up from based on the solutions that, in fact, the, the first, uh, this, this little unit of five here is a comparison, is a, is a four element sorter. So you can kind of, you're looking at this as a piece of code, uh, this separately uh, uh, sorts each of these four uh, elements. So each of those four now uh, groups are relatively sorted within themselves. And somehow the rest of the process is going to intermix. So did, did anybody think a little bit about the lower bound question? We do a little bit of classic computer science. Um, At least one person came up with the, the lower bound. What's the lower bound for these sorting networks? What? For for in general as a function of n. Yes. Minus. And why do you say n minus one? Um, I, I, if you see a general group, or if you see if you see the network is already sorted, then you already need to do n minus one comparison. Um, well, I mean maybe, I mean maybe the easiest lower bound is n over two. Somehow, if you never touch an element, you'll never know where it belongs in the list. So it's easy to see uh, an over two. You need at least an over two comparison, so you need to touch everything at least once. Um, what's an upper bound for, for, for comparison-based sorting? Those of you who are computer science. Uh, that's an upper bound. Can, can you do better than n squared for uh, a sorting algorithm? So like bubble sort does it in n squared time. You grab, uh, how does bubble sort work? So do you, you find the very uh, smallest element so far, or let it bubble up to the top, and you find the second most smallest, and each of those steps takes at most n, then n minus 1, and n minus 2. You sum that up, you get something that's order n squared. Can you do better than n squared for sorting? Logging for God, I can't remember how you can do it. I'm not sure that selective sort achieves it, but merge sort uh, achieves n log n. And I won't prove that that merge sort achieves n log n. But we'll see also that there's essentially a lower bound that we can't have sorting algorithms that based on comparisons which are faster than the order of n log n. How would we make that argument? Uh, Let's, for a moment, not worry about computational complexity, but just worry about the number of comparisons. I.e., we'll have some very potentially complicated algorithm to choose comparisons, but we won't worry about how complicated it is to choose a comparison. We'll just count the, the number of comparisons required. Okay? So we start out, we can imagine, visualize this pen as a non marker You kind of have this bag of n numbers. Um, you know, maybe where they're numbered one through n. Somehow, it's kind of obvious. It doesn't do the symmetry. It doesn't matter uh, if you're just choosing things based on their, uh, well actually maybe it does matter which comparison you choose. But clearly, you're gonna have to choose, you're gonna do a first comparison, okay? You describe an algorithm that does a first comparison. And what happens when you do a first comparison? You're gonna choose two numbers, say uh, we're here, what we've chosen is we've chosen, uh, uh, say, 
the i-th element and the j-th element. So for the first time, we'll choose i1 and j1. And um, the, the result of this comparison will be to, uh, yeah, actually, don't think of this as n numbers. Think of this as, as, as before you know what the sorted list is, the result is going to be some permutation of those n numbers, right? How many permutations of those n numbers are? We have some set with n factorial potential permutations of those n numbers. You can arrange n objects in n factorial ways. So then when we do a comparison, we're going to split into two sets. We're going to have, have one set, which is going to be the set of those permutations, let's say this is p, that are compatible with i1 less than or equal to j1. And we'll have another set of permutations, which are compatible with uh, i2, I mean i1 less than j, i1 more greater than j1. Each of these sets has a bunch of permutations in it. Okay? Now, a, a, a strategy is describing a way of, of, you know, of, of narrowing down the permutation. So imagine here, maybe we choose to do uh, at this. Here, we, we choose to maybe do. Um, I need notation. I'm just going to make it up. I'm going to say I1. I2. Yeah, actually, uh, actually, a better notation would be, I'll call, uh, I'll call this, uh, I'll just call that IJ, and I'll call this I left, J left. You know, the notation isn't so important. Um, and if I do I left and J left here, and I here my strategy, if I had something in this set, I'd, I'd compare um, I, I'll call this comparison I right, J right. Um, this is going to go ahead and split this into another set of permutations. Okay? This, this will be the set of permutations which are, are compatible with um, this one here with um, i is less than or equal to j, and um, i is less than or equal, i right is less than or equal to j right. This set would be, um, sorry, not right, left. This I have the other outcome uh, permutations. Um, I less than or equal to J, comma, I right less than or equal to J right. If you're instead in this, sorry, I keep doing right, and I should do left. This is left, this is left, and we want the other direction now. Here I'd get the same, I'd get another two sets, but now using the right comparisons, right? I've split it to those cases. Now, we might wonder, well, when can a sorting program potentially terminate? Um, when the sorting program terminates, it can only have one thing in its bottom circle. Because if it had more than one permutation in the bottom circle, it would correspond that there would you haven't tested those things, and there would correspond to that would be compatible with either permutation, and so you wouldn't have sorted. Okay, so imagine a strategy is going to keep. We're not talking about how you do the strategy. It's going to keep narrowing down things, so every circle is potentially has only one object in it. I mean, this is what. Merge sort, bubble sort, these are all a strategy. 
Now the question is, is how fast could you narrow things down so that all the bottom things only have one object in it? Well, suppose you had splits that looked like one, maybe you, you put 10% of the objects here and 90% of the objects there. You're going to still have to then split that 90% of the objects. In terms of splitting quickly, the fastest you can possibly hope to split, even though it's not actually possible, would be to split each time 50%. 50%, 50%, 50%. So each time this has half as many objects as in here. This is n factorial over 2. This is n factorial over 2 to the n factorial over 4, n factorial over 4, and so forth. You keep splitting. So the question is, how many times can you split n factorial in half? It's just log 2 n factorial. And uh, so it's log 2 n factorial, which if you think of n factorial as being n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, you can see this is approximately order n log n, because there's n over 2 terms that are at least n over 2 in size. Um, so we get a lower bound of n factorial. And in fact, we can do this on the five element sorting list. And, and we see 4 factorial is 24. Log 2 of 24 is something slightly larger than 4. So we know we need at least 5 elements. It happens the upper bound and lower bound match, but it's not always going to be the case. This is a computer science aside that I'm not going to examine you on, but it's kind of, you know, it's a, a worthwhile argument to see. And for those of you taking machine learning, you can think of sorting as a learning problem. Suppose, you know, here is supervised learning, you're given a set of things, and your goal is to, um, you know, predict the next thing. But suppose you have a set of data, and you want to learn a ranking. You want to learn how these objects are ranked. Well, instead of getting some arbitrary sequence and trying to predict how they're ranked, active learning is, well, how should I select the object so I get the most information about my concepts? So you can imagine sorting. It's like active learning where you're trying to learn a ranking. OK. Um, what's known about sorting networks? I did this already. OK. So what's some more? more sorting network facts, which I wrote down on another sheet of paper. Um, in fact, unknown what the lowest possible, um, what the smallest possible sorting network is for 16 operations. Uh, but the best found so far is 60. If you do that log 16 factorial, I think you get, I did it before I came to class. I forgot it's like 44, 48. But um, um, the best known sort for 16 elements is 60 elements. Uh, this is 16. Um, Hill has said, let's solve this with a genetic algorithm. And uh, we're going to see two, at least, at least two neat ideas involved in how Hill has attempted to solve this with a uh, a genetic algorithm, but let's take a, a break for 10 minutes and then uh, look at how uh, so let's use the genetic algorithm to evolve a sorting network. I, I, I won't examine this, just so you know. But <laughs> I think it's a beautiful piece of computer science proving a lower than bound on, on sorting. And it's, and it, there's lots of machine learning algorithms. It's the same idea. How do you efficiently split the space?